We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And uh, yeah, yesterday uh, was Remembrance Day here in Canada. You have, uh, what, Veterans Day in the U.S.? Yeah, Armistice yeah. Day in the UK. Yeah, <laughs> completely. I'm sorry for the veterans that are out there, and uh, I do, you know, appreciate your uh, service. I just always forget your holiday. Like I, I my well, wife it's not like, exactly oh, like a celebratory <laughs> holiday. It's a solemn holiday. So I know, I know, but I, I, I forgot it existed until uh-huh. my wife said, "How comes there's no mail?" And I'm like, "There's no mail," and then. I actually was wondering why the garbage hadn't gotten picked up today, and that was because yesterday was Veterans Day, so it pushed everything back, because today's usually my day. But Well, in so. recognition of that, I uh, certainly want to thank everyone who's made sacrifices for the freedoms that we enjoy in the countries that we live in. So, uh, yeah, it's, in a, it's an important day. Remembrance Day is what we call it in Canada. So uh, that was yesterday. We're recording this on uh, Tuesday, November I like Remembrance Day. I think that's uh, that's two days ago. It was two days ago. It was eleven. It was on Sunday. It was November eleventh. No, was it? All messing up. I was thinking today. I thought it's on Monday. Veterans Day is on Monday. Well, because the everyone got the day off yesterday because it was the Monday, but the actual day is November the eleventh in Canada. Okay. Well, eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month. End of World War One. Oh, okay. I figured it had some significance. That's I'm that's sorry. how we mark it. That's when okay. the Treaty of Versailles right. was signed. And, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good one. Anyway. It is. All right. All right, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com and uh, leave, a, leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. You can contact us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. But definitely, if you want your question answered, and we will answer it, mm-hmm. question at avrant.com is your number one go-to resource. Yes, the email is the best place to send things by far, question at avrant.com. Yeah. Yeah, hit us up on Facebook and then follow up on Twitter and then hit us up on Facebook again and then follow up on the email. Just send the should just send the email. Just <laughs> send the email. Make make Rob's life easier. That's what I try to do. It is easier is to gather things. All right, we want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. We have Sam this week who did that and left us a PayPal donation. PayPal takes uh, their cut and your credit card information or you know access to your PayPal account. We don't see any of that. And then they give us some cut of that money. So we want to thank Sam for his donation. Yeah, Sam, thank you very much for that PayPal donation. We appreciate it. Those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for our hosting fees and other things. We also want to thank our 75 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you can sign up for a monthly donation to your uh, content creator of choice or choices. If you have more than one that you would like to support, the minimum is a $1 a month, so $12 a year. Uh, the maximum is infinity. We're just mm-hmm. looking for that one infinity, and we're going we to we're going to come to waiting you. on that. When that infinity uh, guy or gal shows up, and uh, we receive those monies, we are going to be doing the podcast from your home. <laughs> 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 it will be nothing but you for <laughs> two straight hours. <laughs> infinity dollars could probably persuade me to do that. Yes. Uh, so thanks very much to our seventy-five patrons over at Patreon.com/slash AVRant Podcast, and yeah, that's a monthly subscription if you would like to sign up. So a dollar a month is the minimum. We're very appreciative of everyone who's done so over there. If you can't uh, support the podcast financially, we completely understand. But if you do figure out some way to support us, let us know and we will mention you on this podcast. So we want to thank Jeff, who decided to go with our advice on two fronts. He called AV Science and they are offering the JVC RS540, which is the same thing as the X790, I guess, projector, Mm -hmm. for uh, 3800 bucks. And and shipping is included in that price. Mm -hmm. So while we cannot promise you will get that price... We can promise you will not see that price on the website. <laughs> so you want to call them. So he placed his order, let them know that we had recommended them. He's hoping the slow HDMI, HDMI handshakes won't bother him too much, but he'll console himself while he waits for 30 seconds for it to switch from one HDMI input to the other. 
with having saved $4,200 versus the NX7 model if he finds himself getting annoyed with that long wait. So $4,200. bucks. You can amortize the waiting period. I was going to say. Across that money. 30 seconds. It's a significant number of times that you can wait to console yourself with $4,200 that you did not spend. But yes, congratulations, Jeff. That's a really nice projector. I'm pretty sure we're going to be mentioning it again at some point in this podcast. So uh, yeah, that's great. And happy to know they do have a good price and shipping included. That's uh, a lower 48 states, of course, is where that applies. But uh, good stuff. Congrats. All right. And the news, uh, this comes from our listener, Carl. Disney's forthcoming streaming service has an official name now. It's Disney+. Plus. <sighs> It is. It's just, that is the name. Disney Plus. It's so bad. Why? And it's a plus symbol. It's a plus symbol, too. Like, plus what? What's the, you know, let's make this equation work. Or it's the other side of it. You can't just plus nothing. So it's just, it's not plus, though. It is a different thing. I mean, it's not like if, you get Disney and this other thing. It's like, like you sign up for Disney Plus. You get all of their movies plus a streaming service like do they send you all the discs it's, you get a free it's just their streaming service free access to their parks for no. as long Heavens as you the no. service <laughs> and the streaming service because that's what the plus would be mm. what if they use dolby vision and not hdr 10 plus wouldn't that be ironic I'd say, I mean, no that's probably what they mean. will do because I don't think they're going to use say, HDR 10 plus I was going to say <laughs> no one's using HDR 10 plus to begin with no, Amazon two, says they are but yeah oh well <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you really want your adult, your your HDR to be sync, not synced up with the audio, let's just get Amazon Prime. I mean, Amazon uses Dolby Vision as well, so I guess they just don't care. Yeah. Hey, if we're going to do something poorly, we might as well do all the things poorly. Mm. Uh, apparently, this this Disney Plus will launch in late 2019, which is no coincidence since that is when their contract with Netflix expires. Mm. And they announced two live-action series featuring Loki in one of them, which I think they announced a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Cassian Andor from Rogue One and the other. I thought they, uh, they also announced uh, Scarlet Witch was going to do one. I don't think that's been officially announced. I'm pretty sure that's rumored. Uh, so I didn't see an official announcement on that one yet. But yes, they're... Well, I guess I won't spoil anything, but uh, interesting choices for characters, let's say, <laughs> given their their current status of... Deadness? Yeah, the, there you go. <laughs> you, can, you can spoil it. What's the spoil? If you haven't seen Infinity War by now, and it happens in the first two seconds of the movie, <gasps> and then Rogue One... Yep. I mean, it's been out for a couple of <laughs> months. A little bit more than that. Exactly. A couple of years. All right. Also in uh, news, the legendary comic book creator Stan Lee has passed away uh, on the 12th, which was uh, Veterans Day here, the day after Remembrance Day in Canada. And he was 95. Now, his health, I think, had been going for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And they, because I remember a couple of years back, or maybe it may have been even as recent as last year, they filmed a whole slew of cameos. And I'm like, ooh, that's not good. <laughs> I hate to say that, but that's, I think I even said it on the podcast, I'm like, oh, that's probably not, that doesn't bode well for his health. So, uh, you know, I, uh, like many of you who have, you know, grew, grow, grown up reading comic books, watching the original Spider-Man series with Stan Lee's voice on it, um, Excelsior and all that, um, it's a sad day. It was a sad day. Uh, I do have some mixed feelings because I feel like there was a lot of stuff like with Jack Kirby and uh, how Marvel was all, how they treated their writers and creators and how many people got absolutely churned by that company <laughs> eaten and not paid their fair share, I think. Uh, but uh, he certainly was an icon and he will be missed. Well, the influence of Stan Lee, uh, I mean, really can't be overstated <laughs> it's he's uh, tremendously influential uh, i mean look at the rise of the marvel cinematic universe even if you aren't into comic books proper um if you're listening to this podcast it's pretty difficult to imagine the current state of theaters and cinema and home theater uh without a lot of the creations that that he was certainly involved in so uh, right. more than that i mean what a legacy that he's leaving behind but more than that i mean everyone and and this isn't just like you know how oftentimes after someone has passed away people will have nothing but nice things to say but while stan lee was alive people had nothing but right. nice things to say about him how friendly he was how generous he was with his time that you know, when young fans would come up to him, he would spend minutes with them, you know, talking about 
what they want to do and what they want to create and nothing but encouraging and friendly to everyone. That's, that's all anybody ever had to say about him. So yeah. uh, a great person, a wonderful legacy he's leaving behind. And uh, yeah, a life to be celebrated uh, as much as we might be sad at his passing right now. Certainly it'll be a celebration of his life and uh, Excelsior. What else can you say? What else can you say? Excelsior. That's right. Uh, Emotiva is having a sale that they said they were never going to have again. <laughs> If you remember, la- was it last year? Was it last year or was it the year before that they that they uh, said that they're never sure doing sales? it was last year. They said they won't won't be ever having sales ever again. All right. Well, I just got an email literally right before this podcast that mm-hmm. said uh, from Emotiva, we're getting in the gifting spirit, earn an Emotiva credit of up to four hundred bucks. The five hundred dollar purchase, they'll give you a hundred dollar reward on your next purchase. Yeah. Yeah. See that? That's how they're. It's it's the the it's language. It's the pe- uh, sale. Shot. Very specific. Up. <laughs> you're not getting any sort of price discount on what you're buying right now, so it's not technically a sale. It's technically exactly a sale. Yeah. Shut up. It's a sale. It's a sale. I guess they found out people like it when prices go down. Oh my god. <laughs> Did you not shoot yourself in the foot by saying you're never having a sale again, and then the holidays rolled around, and everybody's having sales, and you're not, and, nobody, and your sales are staying flat or dipping, and you're like, hmm, I wonder what we can do about this. Oh, yeah, I have an idea. Let's have a sale. Oh, well, we mm-hmm. said we couldn't have a sale. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll just... Yeah, we could do we could do a little. That song, actually did that. remind me on the Evo team of front, Emotiva front, because uh, it's almost November 15th, and guess what is not coming out? <laughs> Is it one of their processors or one of the upgrades to one of their processors? Because it's usually one of those two things yeah, that's that, not coming out. That 16-channel RMC1, it, yeah. it's not going to be coming out on November 15th. In fact, there is a, a post on their very own Emotiva Lounge forums saying RMC1 coming to 2019. That is not November 15th, 2018. Um, but apparently, yeah, the uh, the upgraded HDMI board that they put into their XMC1, which is still awaiting its Dolby Atmos update, which I swear, remember? The, the guy wanted, he was like, should I wait on that or just swap it out for a Marantz pre-pro, which was the was AV8802? <laughs> was that months ago? Years ago? That was three years ago. <laughs> At this point, three I'm years sorry. people I'm have so been waiting. Sorry. But yeah, apparently that HDMI board upgrade has not gone smoothly. People have problems, and that was the basis for the HDMI board in the RMC ones. So and like, well, we can't release it this way. What a surprise! I, 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 we like to give Rob really likes to give Emotiva a hard time about this, but the reality is, in order to make something like a or an amp is one thing. One dude in uh, on a workbench with some tools and some parts mm. can put together an amp. I can't do it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying that it's doable by right. one dude. Building a processor is not a dude or a uh, dude. Oh, and then getting it mass produced. Oh, yeah. It's not. A, it, it is such no, a, it's a huge tremendous undertaking. undertaking. And we like Emotiva. We love yeah. their amplifiers. We, we continue to recommend them all the time. The only thing that has ever bugged me about Emotiva is announcing products, giving them a release date, starting to take pre-orders, accepting people's money, and then not delivering the product for three years. <laughs> I am not okay with that part. So just yeah. that that is yeah. easily fixed. That yeah. is a choice to just say or... In fact, it's a choice to just not say that you're making a product that isn't ready to be sold yet. Just wait until it's ready. That's all you have to do, and then I'll yeah. be happy. I uh, I just wish they'd get out of the processor game altogether. Well, there's that. Yeah, they, they should. I understand why they did it. I understand why they do it. There's people who want it. There's people, who, and I think there's lots of happy customers. And if you're a happy Emotiva customer mm-hmm. with their processor, and you're like, I don't need Dolby Atmos. You know what? Well, yeah. Great. Fantastic. Absolutely. I, I mean, the, the, once they put the product out, it's usually pretty good. But, you know, stick to your integrated amps, your two-channel stuff, as far as, you know... Uh, and your uh, actual amplifiers, which are the and your bread and butter. Right, right. Yeah, all right. Some comments here. Jason on Facebook initially asked why his PS4, which is connected via optical toss link to his receiver and HDMI to, to his TV, is switching to two-channel PCM output whenever he is watching a physical Blu-ray disc. Everything other than Blu-ray disc was outputting 5.1 signals just fine. Turns out a recent firmware update must have reset the audio settings on his PS4, not the system's main audio output settings, mind you. There's like four different audio places <laughs> in that thing. <laughs> like, at least two. Yeah, think, so yeah, at least my two. brother has a PS3 and uh, my autistic brother has a three ps3 and it, it keeps cra- like he one crapped out on them and another one's crapping out on them so you know 
they're my parents are like desperately like oh my god mm. PS3s cost so much I'm like yeah because they don't make them anymore that's called supply and demand they don't make them anymore like oh what are we gonna do can we can we upgrade to a PS4 I'm like it won't be backwards compatible. Why not? <laughs> okay. Let me explain to you about chips and mm-hmm. how chipsets work and how... <laughs> just don't. Don't even explain. It yeah, just I, already, I already tried. It, there's a lot of blank looks. But, uh, you know, my new modus operandi or my standard operating procedure is my dad texts me with a question about the PS4 and I just wait. Mm-hmm. Until he Googles it. Because it's a pain. I mean, it's like, there's five different menus up there. There's no way I can walk you through this <laughs> on text. You know, I will have to hunt and peck mm-hmm. for the right menu. Anyways. Uh, so not the uh, main audio output settings, mind you. No, the audio output settings that can only be accessed once a Blu-ray disc has started playing and you press the options button during playback. Mm-hmm. Jason only vaguely remembered how he got to those settings and had to adjust them in the past. So he figured someone else might also benefit from the reminder. Yeah, PS4 is, or PS3, I mean, has been the only the only box I've had in recent memory that will pure, like, if you don't use it regularly, mm. it's like, nah, we're going, we're factory resetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to use us? Screw you. We're changing all your settings. I'm like, wait a second. How come it's doing this? And the lot. I, it it will lose connection like my Harmony remote, which has a blue, mm, you know right, it's right, supposed right. to be connected. Bluetooth Bluetooth. Connection, yep. Nope, you don't use a PS3 in a while. It forgets that right away. Uh, <laughs> it, it's the only machine that I know that does that, and that that the menus in the PS3 are ludicrous. Yeah, well, the PS4 <laughs> is not a tremendous improvement on that. Quite similar on the uh, audio output adjustment front. So yeah, yeah, there is the weird thing. You actually have to have a Blu-ray disc in, have it actually playing, then you press options and you get an entirely separate audio menu that lets you choose bitstream output from there. So yeah, good. All right. Kevin on Facebook enjoyed our take on the Viva Audio Credenza horn-loaded speakers that he asked about last week. He loves, he still loves how they look, but didn't realize how ridiculously expensive they are. But to be fair, the one article that mentioned their price said 250,000 euros. So not quite the $300,000 that we said last week. That's pretty close. It's pretty close, about $280,000 uh, yeah, US dollars. So If you had $280,000, uh, yeah. what's 20,000? I I had rounded up, so let's let's be fair. I have tax and shipping. So he figures he could get his dream speakers from JBL Synthesis and have them custom crafted into a cabinet if he had that sort of budget. Yeah, you probably could. You could probably build a whole house around the stupid things. <laughs> Jordan on Twitter knows people often ask for suggestions for demo material, so he wanted to recommend the often mentioned uh, Master and Commander and the not so often mentioned Den of Thieves as great showcases for surround sound and impressively low frequency effect. I have never liked Master and Commander. Mm. Never. It does get mentioned quite a bit as it a, does as and i don't material. i don't know what i mean maybe the one time i watched that I was like i mean yeah it's got some booms but what's the big deal i didn't really think it was all that impressive but i would do would be willing to give it another shot i would not watch the whole movie i would watch whatever the scene is that's what people are talking about then of these i don't know at all so that that's good. is that a video game is it is that a video game i feel like that's I, a video game no it's a movie den of thieves yeah what's it about i is i it? have no idea are no there clue. thieves? They live Ten in a thieves? cave someplace, maybe? If there's That's no funny. thieving, I'm going to be disappointed. <sighs> it's probably a romantic comedy. All right, Josh. Josh has a Denon X6300H and a Samsung KS8000 4K TV and a JVC X790 projector. 790 should do 4K, right? Should oh, it definitely did. That's, that's the one we were just talking about. If he leaves the HDMI output set uh, to dual or auto dual, he doesn't get any picture on either display. If he manually sets the video output to monitor one, everything shows up on the flat panel just fine. If he sets the uh, video output to monitor two, everything shows up just fine on the projector. But dual audio gives him nothing. Yes. Is there a better solution for having to manually change uh, then having to manually change the HDMI video output settings every time. So what's the reason for this? Is it the uh, is it the the frame rate? Is it sixty hertz versus thirty hertz or something like that? No, I mean it, it must just be that the uh, the television uh, and the projector uh, going back to the Denon. The the Denon is saying, okay, I've got two displays and whatever his sources are. Uh, right. Apparently, both of those displays, even in their standby modes, must be. Producing enough of a signal that the the source device is attempting to handshake with both and says, "Well, I can't, so you get nothing. You you get a blank screen on both of them until oh, you tell me." Oh, because one's off. In 
it went off, but not off, off. Right. Not like off, but not physically unplugged. Right. Right. It's in standby. So this is not the, so we've had scenarios before where it's like, okay, if the television is in standby and the projector is on, that works. But if the television is on and the projector is in standby, that doesn't work. We've had that scenario before. And in right. those cases, I have suggested attaching whatever device it is that causes the problem to the zone two HDMI mm. output because you can turn the zone two on the AV receiver off completely. And then the source device will definitely only see one display when zone two is off. And right. then when you turn zone two on, it'll connect to whatever display is attached to zone two and the other display when it's in standby was not causing a problem. That works if you got the scenario where, you know, it works one way with one of the devices in standby, but not the other one. But here, he can have both either display in standby. It doesn't work for either of them. And it doesn't even, it doesn't give him an image either way. So the whole zone two solution is not going to work in this case, because as soon as he turns zone two on, even with the other display attached to the main HDMI output of the Denon in standby, the apparently the storage device is still going to see both displays and attempt to handshake with both and give you nothing on either mm. of those. So I can't suggest doing the zone two. So the only thing I can think of, and I don't think it's terribly convenient because it's not a remote control is using like a physical HDMI splitter. Right. Where, where you just press you, the button, <laughs> you hit a button and it like physically moves a piece of metal between two HDMI ports that would allow you to have one output from the Denon into this little physical HDMI switch. Uh, Sewell makes a nice one for 25 bucks that passes, you know, all the highest bit rates and all the forms of HDCP and all that. And it's just a physical switch moving back and forth, but you have to physically press the button. It's not remote controllable. So I don't know if that's any help whatsoever because uh, the I'm easiest solution for this is a Harmony remote. And creating a macro. That's the easiest yeah. solution for this is the Harmony remote. Yeah. If you get a Harmony remote and you program a, a macro, so you're like, watch the projector. It's going right. to do this. You know, all the stuff that it's doing. Watch the TV. It's going to switch to monitor one or whatever. That's which, right. Whatever one it is. Yeah. That's, that's the solution. The and you would have to switch. make sure you remember that. Like, for example, I would make sure that by default, you've got your Denon set to monitor one only, and that's connected to your flat panel. That means you could turn on the flat panel and get to the menus or press the macro button, you know, to make sure and switch it over to monitor two, fire up the projector, and that should now work on the projector. And then I would probably always want to make sure when I'm done using the projector that I press the macro button to switch it back to monitor one because I wouldn't want to have to turn on the projector just to confirm. That you could, it's probably, going to the you could probably do that uh, with the off command. The off command automatically. Well, does the that. off on the harmony just turns everything off. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Put no, but then if you put in a command in the off thing, then it would always try to switch HDMI yeah. inputs. I don't know if it's discreet yeah, well, that's what, enough. You, you always wanted to switch to you know to monitor, monitor one, one at the yeah. end when you're done. You should be able to do that. Yeah, you know, that's the last thing it does before. It yeah, it might, might take a little bit of tooling around in the Harmony it's setup. It's better than pressing the physical button. It's better than having <laughs> to go dig through the menu every single time or having to get up and go press a physical button, yes. But yeah, I don't have a better solution than that because if, if both of them are this way, it doesn't matter which one is in standby. Neither of them is going to give you an image ever if they're both receiving a signal from, from dual HDMI outputs, then uh, yeah, even the Zone 2 solution doesn't work. Sorry, Josh, there's not really a better way. Yeah. Galen. Galen has a TV that is behind a two-way mirror in his master bedroom with the TV off. It looks just like a mirror when the TV turns on. It's output, it outputs enough light to be seen through the two-way glass. When the TV... Uh, cool said that, but being behind the mirror, the sound from the TV is blocked. You don't want to use sound from the TV anyways. So he's looking to install a pair of in-ceiling speakers. He asks first, which in-ceiling speakers should he buy? Keeping in mind that this is for a bathroom, so there might be some humidity to consider. Uh, dude, they put speakers on boats all the time. <laughs> so yeah. so there's no reason why you know any outdoor speaker yes. should be 100%. And in fact, the humidity you're going to put in this room is uh, nothing compared to, well, at least floor the humidity, but nothing compared to you know rain. <laughs> snow that's right yes <laughs> so yeah you just need an outdoor speaker yeah there are definitely uh weather resistant in ceiling speaker models and surprise surprise outdoor speaker depot sells uh in ceiling speakers that can be used outdoors oh right? my god 
hot really? in high humidity environments. So, Do they have uh, ports in the back for little animals to make uh, homes in? Well, they're fully enclosed. One that, oh. that wouldn't be an in ceiling, right? That'd be a that'd be a full speaker. Which I know. I always thought that outdoor speakers should have ports. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. But these. If these you don't are... know what I'm talking about, I'm making fun of a very specific speaker manufacturer. Please, yes. in the comments below, identify said speaker. There, manufacturer. there are more than more than one who do that. They really? Do that. I've only seen the one, so you know which one I'm talking about. Yes, yes, we do. But uh, yeah, as far as in ceiling goes, Outdoor Speaker Depot definitely does have it. Now, the ones that I like would be the Ice 640. WRS, because they actually have one called the I-640, which is a regular indoor in-ceiling speaker. It's having the WRS, I don't know, weather resistant system, maybe? I don't know, something like that. But WRS is on the end of it. Uh, the I-640 WRS or the I-840 WRS, if you want the 8-inch version instead of the 6.5-inch version. But right now, those are out of stock, but they're like, yeah, there's more coming in. It's like a two-week wait at this point, they're saying. So yeah. if you're willing to wait that amount, uh, that's a really good value. Value. Uh, they do have a less expensive one, just the ICE 600 WRS, but that's got a, like a pretty crappy tweeter. So I would wait the two weeks. Uh, right. yeah. The TV installed in the small alcove behind the mirror, 24 inches high, 36 inches wide, and only 13 inches deep. He needs something mm -hmm. to power the in-ceiling speakers that can fit in the space along with the TV and also be remote controlled through the mirror somehow. What do we suggest? Okay, wait a second here. Remote control through the mirror. Uh, it's long... I mean, it depends, I guess, where the IR receiver is, but you can put the yeah. IR blaster on it if you really... And I assume to. he has some way of remote controlling the TV right now. Right. I would, I would so think. So usually, yeah. So, I mean, there's all kind of little amps that can do this, right? There are. Uh, I mean, surprisingly, not as many as you might think, but... Uh, I, 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 didn't we just talk about that Amazon one that uh, yes. should so be... That should work for this. That's one answer would be the Amazon Echo Link amp uh, because that, of course, you can control with a app on your smartphone, which would totally work. And that would also give you access to all of their wireless streaming features. It also gives you a dedicated subwoofer output if you happen to want to do that. But of course, you don't have to. The only thing there is that the Echo Link amp is $300 and maybe yeah. you don't want to spend that much. It's certainly small enough physically. Uh, no problem there. Uh, one option if... So most televisions have an audio output that can be variable meaning that it just uses the television's existing volume up and down controls and right. that varies the output out of its rca or a 3.5 millimeter audio jack and if you have a television that has that then you could just use uh one of our favorite you know the dayton apa 102 because that's only like seven and a half inches deep uh, and it's 90 bucks, so it's very affordable, got plenty of power, especially if just for a pair of in-ceiling speakers, and that could totally work if your television has variable audio output, but not all televisions do, so it's not a guarantee that that's going to work, so uh, one that will work for sure, regardless of what kind of audio output you have, and if you don't want to pay $300 for the Amazon Echolink amp, will be Monoprice's Unity amp, which we mentioned last week. Um, this is actually meant, it's got like the mounting thing, so you can mount it right on the uh, Visa uh, mounting holes on the back of any TV. So that's oh, okay. how small that is. Um, it actually also has a dedicated subwoofer output if you want to <laughs> if you want to ever add a subwoofer. So I like that feature of it. And then it's got optical audio in, 3.5 millimeter in, and regular RCA in. So whatever type of audio output your television has, this will handle it. It is $180, so it's not super inexpensive. but it's super small, though. <laughs> it's super small, very convenient, has all the features that you could possibly need. And it also comes with an extension for the IR receiver. Right. So as long as you can get that little IR receiver somewhere where you can get the signal to it, uh, it, it actually comes with an IR extender and a little remote. So you can program any universal remote to control it and uh, use the Usually little the IR Usually the TV extender. remotes too will also That's give right. you the ability to control something like that. So. That's right. So I like that Monoprice Unity. I think that's the good solution. Oh my God, it's a thousand degrees in here. I might have to go open that door. <laughs> I'm so used to being in here with the door closed that I close the door and yeah. my EcoB is not sensing the sensor that's in here. So it doesn't know I'm in here and it's like <laughs> 95 degrees in this room. I'm you roasting. and your EcoB, what a, what a tale. Uh, it's just far enough away. I wish I, I would pay more if they would give me a better stupid sensor thing to work through <laughs> more stuff. All right, um, Peter. 
Peter's in the UK, so keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Peter's looking for a new TV to go in his family room. He has a dedicated theater, so it's not the primary mo movie watching TV. This is mostly for TV shows and streaming during the day when the room is bright. Nevertheless, he wants good HDR performance, preferably with Dolby Vision support, and good black levels. He's mostly looking for around 55 inches. He'd be willing to spend upwards of 1,500 pounds. His wife would prefer a budget of around 700 pounds. You guys, <laughs> gotta get, you guys gotta get together on that one. And they both probably be fine if the final decision landed somewhere in the middle. So we'd like a low, uh, a low, high, and middle recommendation for our, and our reasons for each. Um, do they sell TCLs over there? And then are they cheap? Like they so are. So TCL is now selling some TVs in the UK, but not the 600 series that we like. It's uh, their lower tier edge lid only series Ugh, are what no. they're bringing over there to begin no, no. with. So uh, yeah, and they don't sell Vizio uh, in the UK. So our, our top value choices aren't really available. And the ones that are top value and do Dolby Vision. But they have, they're going to have brands that we're not familiar with at all though because I mean, sometimes like, they do in, yeah in australia yeah. they had a couple of brands i was like who is that like high sense yeah. and stuff like that i'm like who's well, Hisense? It's high sense is here in the i know but the they well. weren't when i left right. they right. were when i came back <laughs> you know when I, when I got to australia i'm like who's that and there was other ones over there whose names i don't remember so i mean so we got our our, our main brands and we're just going with samsung and uh what, LG. lg and sony, sony those are the three yep those are available and i mean there are certainly options that, that are in there. Uh, now, so I'm going to go right for the one that I think you should get, and that is last year's B7 OLED from okay. LG. Because... So it's $1,300 on Amazon UK. I don't know not if you exactly can... exactly in the middle. Of those I don't know if you can prices. find it less. Well, it's under $1,500. It's not the maximum. It's definitely... Not, and it's not, <laughs> not quite twice the price of what your wife would like to spend. It's a little <laughs> under quite. twice the price. With tax, it probably is. But... It's such a good television. I'm not saying it's not. And I mean, it, well, yeah. If you can get that, get that. Get the B7 because, yeah, uh, the B8 is available now for 1,500 pounds in the so UK. You're saving 200 pounds on last year's you're model. You're saving 200 pounds by going with last year's model, and there's exceedingly little difference between the two. In fact, the, the B8 uses the Alpha 7 processor instead of the Alpha 9 processor, and the Alpha 7 is essentially exactly the same as the processor that was in the B7. So there's exceedingly little, little, little difference between the B7 and the B8, so save a couple hundred pounds and get the B7. Uh, now, if... Okay, why would he not want an OLED that costs less than a Sony LCD? There's really no argument. I mean, there is the Sony uh, in the Sony's North America. Brighter, right? What's that? Sony would be brighter, I guess, would be I the guess. argument. That's the only yeah, argument I can think super of. Super worried about burning, which don't be. But if you were, uh, so yeah, over here in the states we call it the X900F, but over there they call it the XF90, exact same television. But yeah, the Sony XF90 is available for fourteen hundred and twenty pounds, so it's more expensive than the B7 OLED. I, it, yeah, uh, so. Let's go down. What, what's less expensive? I would have to point you to a Samsung, which means you're not getting Dolby Vision, but that's really not the end of the world. Um, the Q6 FN, so that's their entry level in their QLED uh, televisions, their LCD televisions from Samsung. Uh, that is £1,000 in the UK. Uh, okay. These are all Amazon UK prices, so it, you might be able to find for less or whatever, but I'm assuming Amazon UK is fairly representative. Uh, now, the Q6 is edge lit and that, but you know, going up anymore makes it more expensive than the OLED, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, and if you really want to get down to close to that 700, 700 pound price point, for 750 pounds, there is the NU8000 series from Samsung. So that is like the top of their non QLED models so it doesn't have quite as wide color it's not quite as bright the contrast isn't quite as good but it's only 750 pounds if you really got to get the price down All right yeah i guess i like the oled <laughs> out of those too um, i mean it's so much better it's so much better than i mean the it, i guess the, the two i would present your wife would be the the samsung the q q1 whatever that was and then the um the OLED and because there's a 300, 300 pound difference, right? 300 and, pounds between a thousand and 1300, and yeah. Yeah. and the Q6 is not as good as the OLED, so spend spend that money. So he says he also wants a new Onkyo AV receiver. He says it's the house brand with 4K HDR and Dolby Vision pass through to power his 3.1 Yamaha speaker setup. Any suggestions? 
Does that, I mean, I understand that's a house brand, but it's only 3.1. <laughs> you know? So just we, about anything, really. Any, any, anything will do these days. You know, so, I mean, if, if it does it have to be Onkyo? Because you could probably save money going... I mean, I don't know. Maybe I don't can't. know if you could. Yeah. yeah I mean, they're no, all going to be quite it. similar. Because yeah. I, I, the model that came Everything to mind... passes all this stuff. Anything yeah. that was made in the last year or two is going to pass right. all this stuff. That's the Dolby Vision. That stuff, you don't have to worry about that. It's powering 3.1 speakers, you don't have to worry about that. I mean, room correction... I wouldn't worry about that either. You got 3.1. I mean, I don't yeah, know not that too much. You're, you're doing much with it. So I just get literally what was on sale. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I jumped to the uh, TXNR474, 340 pounds on Amazon. So I don't, I, I, a house Seems brand, like he, what is, I, I'm not sure what he means, like a, where he works. That's what he can get maybe or something. I don't know. Or maybe that's just the, the brand they've always owned. The brand they've always owned. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what he what he meant by that that by that phrase but whatever if you want to stick with Onkyo I, I don't see any reason to spend more than the 474 it'll do all the things you want to do so yeah all right let's go move on to Rob M it's different than you it is it doesn't sound different than you starting I mean, I've been, it's, I, <laughs> all it's Robs do this apparently Rob start with a five base Synology NAS unit network attached storage network right. attached storage I'm getting, I'm getting it. Over time, he added two additional five bay expansion. It sounds like you. It's you know, and now has. If you have questions for the podcast, Rob, just just ask him. <laughs> he added two additional five bay expansion units. So now he has 15 hard drives using Synology's hybrid RAID, giving him about 95 terabytes of storage, and he's running out of space, sir. You have a problem. Sounds like a mix of four and eight terabyte drives, most likely. Yeah. Ninety-five. How do you run out of storage? Uh, this is you know what? when you're backing up Ultra HD Blu-rays that take up sixty-six gigs a piece. That's how. Well, okay. Can I just say something? I had a friend who did. I I I didn't. I found out he was doing this uh, by kind of stumbling. Out, uh, uh, I went to his house and he he had his computer out and there was a bunch of stuff there. He would go to Redbox, rent a movie, and then rip it to his sure. drive and then return it. The, the rent, like, rip, that, return. Yep. That's stealing. <laughs> it's it's stealing i'm sorry it is don't do that it's stealing i felt very bad i mean i i don't know anyway since the hybrid raid allows you to mix different capacity hard drives and replace drives on the fly one option is just keep upgrading with higher capacity hard drives of course Synology offers other nas units that can house more drives and expand to as many as 180 drives but they're kind of pricey you yeah. mean you didn't already spend a bunch of money or could he go a bit nuts and go for the backup pod with enough space for 45 or 60 hard drives? What the heck is a backup pod? So the backup pod is, so yeah, there's a place called Backblaze, which like uh, basically they're a subscription service where, where they'll, they'll store your content in their clouds. But they're like, hey, we came up with this way of making like 60 hard drive NAS units that fit into server racks. And uh, maybe somebody else wants to buy them so you can buy their like rack unit things. They don't With supply the, the hard drives. I was going to say, do they supply the, the hard drives as well? Nope. They're between like $4,500 and $6,000 just for the unit. And then you have to populate all the hard drives on top of that price. So that, that is not cheaper than Synology. It's just that the enclosure itself can hold a lot more hard drives than any individual Synology unit can. How big is this box? Oh, it's big. <laughs> it looks big. It's enormous. Well, think about 60 hard drives in there, man. Okay, 40. Oh, you got to buy all this stuff separately? Well, you can. Uh, so, uh, they have a thing where they sell the back pods, uh, but right now that site is like down. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, Shop is currently unavailable. So the total parts this. list is like 3400 bucks. Yeah. Just for the parts for this yeah. thing. They do actually list the parts if you want to buy it all separately and put it together yourself. You can save some money that way. It's still in the thousands. But That's... you know what? So are the super high capacity Synology units. They are also in the thousands of dollars. So he is like, if I'm going to replace something that can, with it, something that can hold 15 hard drives and be ex expanded, you know, he's into thousands of dollars. Yeah. So what are our thoughts on what he should do to address this rapidly increasing local storage needs? Dude, you should just contact Amazon and use their cloud storage. <laughs> you're practically a service at this point or the backblaze guys i guess but the problem yeah. is is that 
if he is using it for movie backups and he's streaming it off of his yeah. NAS, it, it, they, you don't have the bandwidth. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, just it's not going to stream Ultra HD Blu-rays at you know 150 megabits per second. Um, so my first thought, and this is always my thought for my own storage needs and anyone else's, is you keep what you have and you basically just start a new NAS. <laughs> Because rather than replacing wholesale what you already have, right? I'm like, well, you've run out of capacity on what you have currently. You you could swap out drives for you know 12 terabyte drives or whatever and keep going that way. But I would just begin a new NAS. You can have two NAS, like even if you're using say an NVIDIA Shield or whatever as your Plex server, you can have it looking at two network locations at the same time. It's not a problem to have two NAS. Uh, units on your network and and just be looking so at should you buy them. one of these box these pod things well i mean how how much are you gonna go up to 45 or 60 hard drives i mean i guess if you are it, it could make six, five thousand dollars it's craziness um i well i mean if you buy okay so tough time if, if he let's say he bought that, then he yeah. took all the drives out of what he's got and put yeah. it into there. Put fifteen drives into there, and then yeah. just kept adding to it. And then just kept adding to it, and then took the the Synology the ones rates that he already that, has, and then sell those to help offset the yeah. price somewhat. I mean, it's not yeah. going to be a lot. It's definitely but... not going to be a. T- I. Are you ever going to get to forty five or sixty hard drives? Because that's that's. Well, I guess that's what you, the real question is. The question is, really he's gotten to... How long did it take him to get to 95 terabytes? Right. Did it take him his entire life and he is 60? Or did it take him uh, the last two years? <laughs> In which case, yeah. he should probably buy the pod thing and just and not even... And just, just keep be done everything with he's it? Got. I don't just, know. Just keep everything he has and just start adding drives to that thing. I mean, the other reason I kind of like just keeping what you have and then adding more is that what, whatever we're doing, I mean, uh, our requirements for bandwidth only keep going up, not down. So yep. you keep older, smaller files with lower bit rates on your old stuff. And you, 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 because if you buy one NAS unit now, like that's it. You're, you're stuck with whatever processing power and bandwidth it has. And if five or 10 years in the future, you find out, oh, I need something with more processing power or higher bandwidth. Well, now you're stuck with that. You have to replace the whole thing wholesale again. Right, so if you're saying if he if he got the pod and then if you got the pod, pod thing, I'd still keep what you have. Got and he got rid of all the Synology stuff, then and he put everything in there. Then he decides he's going to upgrade to 8K right. two years from right. now. Exactly. And now you're stuck with the pod and you can't. So I'm 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 sort of in favor of buying what you need as you go. You know, giving yourself some headroom, but not not this amount of headroom. This seems like too much headroom. Yeah. Yeah. So I, don't I, can, know, I can get behind that. Yeah, I'd look at like the 12 bay Synology units, which can be expanded with other 12 bay expansion units. They are over a thousand dollars, but they're not five thousand mm. dollars. And I and I'd keep what you have. I'd just I'd keep going. All right, Carl. Carl would like a recommendation for a pair of headphones for t- watching TV and movies. Comfort is the number one priority, but obviously sound quality needs to be top notch. He's willing to spend fi- as much as five hundred bucks. He'd like a wired recommend- recommendation, a wireless recom, and a wireless recommendation. What would we suggest? So, uh, Audio Technica just came out with an M fifty Bluetooth version. Okay. So, if you've ever heard us talk about the M fifties before, M fifty AT. Whatever it is, ATH M50 M50s. would be yeah. the normal wired version. So there's a wired version, and then now they just came out with a wireless version. And all reports are that the wireless version are, are very good. Okay. That all the ones I've read have, have been that they're very good. They're Bluetooth. Uh-huh. They have all the latest, uh, not all the latest codecs, but in, they have like aptX and the, the ones right. that get you CD quality. So anything above that's ridiculous anyways. So... They are, I think, one ninety nine right now. I think they're brand new, so you're gonna probably mm-hmm. find them for one ninety nine. And uh, the wired versions, you're gonna find them as low as like one hundred and twenty. Yeah, usually around one fifty for sure. Yeah, but, uh, sometimes lower. Okay. Um, so those are the two. Those that's what I would recommend. All right. Now, for me, for a wired one, I jump straight to Sennheiser. Uh, now you wanted. He said he wanted uh, sealed, right? And he wanted uh, closed back. Yeah. Did he so, say that? It say no, that it wasn't. There. It was in the email. Sorry, I didn't put it right. in the thing. Yeah, he did say that. that he wanted sealed. So uh, they're HD five nine eight 
CS, which the C, I guess, is closed or something like that. Anyway, because the regular HD 598s are now the HD 599s. Those have open back, but they have a sealed version. So okay. it's the HD 598 CS. That's the sealed version. They are the most comfortable headphones I've ever worn, um, just as far as their their wearing comfort design. And the sound quality is really good, too. $175, so certainly right. under $500. Uh, and they come with a nice long 10-foot cord and the, the larger plug that would plug into a Navy receiver. So very appropriate for TV or movie watching. Uh, for wireless, my concern there... So Sennheiser has their... Uh, specifically wireless ones that like come with its own RF base. Right, right. My brother has those. I, yeah. I, I think I have a pair of them floating around here someplace that my mother-in-law used before she passed. Right. And I, so. it, that's the one thing I inherited. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Tom, you want these headphones, right? I'm like, I, yes. <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> I have a, I have so, a so those issue. ones from Sennheiser, they're not using Bluetooth. They're using their own proprietary radio frequency signal. But almost all of them are open back. Uh, they do yeah. have a sealed back design, but it's not really the greatest. So I would kind of look to uh, some sealed Bluetooth headphones. But my concern is that I don't only want aptX, I want aptX low latency because mm. I don't want a lip sync delay. And aptX low latency really is low latency. It works really well. So I don't know if those Audio-Technica M50s, if they have the low latency version or not. I'm, I'm checking not sure. right now. Hold on. Yeah. Uh, but one that I know that does and has pretty nice sound uh, quality is uh, Plantronics. Um, they've got, uh, shoot, what was the name of the thing? Uh, Backbeat Pro, I think. Yes, Backbeat Pro from Plantronics. Oh, Pro 2. Don't get them mixed up. Backbeat okay. Pro 2. Uh, $200 for those. They do have uh, Bluetooth aptX low latency, and then you will need a Bluetooth transmitter, and this is whether you go with the Audio-Technicas or these Plantronic ones. Uh, I like the ones from Aventry. Aventry, um, they have uh, a Bluetooth transmitter called the AudioCast, and it is aptX low latency as well, and it can actually ca um, transmit to two pairs of wireless headphones at the exact same time. So that's nice, and those are only uh, like 50 bucks. So yeah, that's... That's what I'd go for on there. Find anything out about those audio technicals? I, it, it, I can't, it, I'm trying. <laughs> it, finding ones that support low latency, that, that's not as common as I would like it to be, to be honest. I wish there were more um, that worked with the low latency version because it is, it is very effective. It, it makes sure that you're not getting a weird lip sync problem waiting for the latency of a, a regular bluetooth connection aptex is decent but it's still enough that you you would notice a bit of a lip sync delay well the the one i could i saw it just said it has it says aptx codex aptx like, yeah. mm. i don't know what that means but not aptx dash ll i don't know yeah. the plantronics will work that i know Anywho. <laughs> yeah i'm still looking i'm still looking it's <laughs> still going. Do you wait, want wait, me to wait, wait, here. I found question? it. I found you it. Found Hold it. on. Shut up. I'm very close. I'm on the audio technical website. Research on Features. the Features. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. Thrilling uh -huh. podcasting. Going Podcast on. material. This is this is why you go. This is why you come here. Specs. Wait, I missed uh -huh. it. Specs downloads. I, I pressed Features. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is especially mm -hmm. riveting in the video version where you get to I'm watch sure it is. Watch looking me look down at, at his screen and keyboard. It just says a a two DP A V R C P H F P H S P. That's what it says. It doesn't say anything about. Uh, I oh, don't know if it's it got the low latency. Though. It doesn't look like it has a low latency. Doesn't look like it. There you go. Anyhow, I did want to say about that uh, the the M fifties in general. Yeah. They one of the things that are first of all their sound quality has been commented on numerous times. Right. So it, it is we don't really need to talk about that anymore. They are very good, but build quality is what really. Mm brings them to the next level i mean these things are bulletproof mm -hmm. now when i first got them they were not the most comfortable headphones i'd ever worn mm. they they did require some break-in uh they were just a little tight for me but then you know after wearing them for a bit they be quickly became the you know very comfortable headphones mm -hmm. i don't think any headphones i own are comfortable enough to wear for you know five six seven hours at a time you gotta get some of those sennheiser hd i'm huh? gonna have to try them then i guess because i i even my uh oppos pm2s mm -hmm. are they are very comfortable but i would not want to wear them for longer than two or three hours at a time all right carl still 
Sorry, next question for Carl. He wants our take on his power protection situation for his projector. He has a whole house surge protectors on his main electrical panel for his HVAC system, and he has a small trip light outlet protector for, uh, for his power, projector's power cord up in his attic. He's careful to never use a projector when there's a storm in his area. Does everything look okay, or should he be using something different? You need battery backup, dude, because yeah. it's not just storms that knock out power. It's branches falling down in a little bit of wind. It's some stupid squirrel chewing on a cable and electrifying <laughs> itself it's a failure of a transformer that has nothing to do with anything else you, you cannot predict when power is going to go out so looking at what he's got here and i mean the, this is all surge protection stuff yes. which is great yeah i mean the whole house surge protector that's on your electrical panel another one on your hvac yeah. unit I'm, I'm totally in favor of that but that doesn't really impact your projector whatsoever right. and then the little triplet i mean that I don't know. Is that doing anything? <laughs> That's like, I mean, all it's gonna it's gonna yes. sacrifice itself, and hopefully it'll, it'll, itself. it'll block it'll block whatever search is going through. But I wouldn't bet the farm on it. Yeah. I wouldn't bet my two thousand dollar projector on it. That's for sure. No, no. So, now, yeah. would you want to put any kind of battery unit up in your attic, though? That's no. another question. Not really. I certainly wouldn't. I, yeah. I, I mean, they've got um, like APC has that nice small form factor, the lithium ion one. Which which could potentially work just in terms of space and that, but I I still wouldn't want to put anything with a battery up in the attic where it gets it could potentially get crazy hot in some right. houses. So yeah, I, I want you to have. Well, a it looks like there's a, just a plug in the it's attic. It's just a plug. It's <laughs> just know? a plug. So I mean, there's some other issues. Not I won't say issues, but other things going on here as well. I mean, I mean, is there a way to get to? Because he's obviously got attic access to all this stuff. Right. You know, first of all, you're not supposed to just have a plug in your attic. <laughs> sure about that. Pretty sure that's not up to code. You know, th there should be it plugs in the room, no. and you you plug in, and then there's a Romex in the attic. So you know, the outlet should be installed near the the projector, and then you run that Romex back to you know a whatever it is, a female outlet or a male outlet or whatever it is at the bottom near there, so you can plug it into uh, your uh, battery backup. Battery backup. No. Um, if you've got this much access in your attic, I, dude, you've got, you really have no excuse not to not do this. You should be, mm. you should, you have should an, have an outlet, even if it's one that has, yeah, the male outlet near yeah. wherever, yeah, your projector is. Yeah, that yeah. can definitely be done. Yep. I mean, you can just see this outlet. I mean, I don't know if you guys can see it on the YouTube yet, or maybe you will when it's finished, but. I mean, it's looking a little sketch already. I mean, it's a little, it's a little rusty up there. You know, I don't know. I mean, this is pro this is not up to code. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a. Yeah, that I, I would change that. That that yeah. that would be my advice. Greg, first up, Greg says thank you for recommendations last week on his thirty five hundred dollar Canadian uh, basement home theater. The basement is Canadian and the money is also Canadian. That's okay. right. To clarify, since we wondered aloud about his budget for other things like seating risers, uh, a seating riser and acoustic treatments, he does have a separate budget to cover seating and decor, and the riser for the back row is already included in that. So that's good. Mm -hmm. All right. On the topic of room treatments, the floor would be carpeted. He was planning on building the riser for himself so that he can serve double duty as a base trap. His wife is into crafts, so they were already planning to make some DIY panels together with images printed on the fabric. His plan was to have a couple of panels on each side wall for the first reflection points, a large panel on the back wall, and thick curtains on the front wall to, for that classic theater look, plus the curtains over the hallway entrance to cover the one window. Do we think it's a solid plan, or should he be doing something uh, more as far as acoustic treatments go? I mean... I like having panels behind the front speakers as well. I mean, if you're gonna have if you have if you're gonna have curtains there anyways, if it's thick curtains that are now like open, so they're you know bunched up and all that. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty okay. I mean, uh, what yeah. is a panel behind that really gonna do? It's not gonna hurt anything. He doesn't have any corner hurt, trapping, right. but. Uh, which would be the one thing that would stand out to me. But he's going to have the big base trap in the form of the riser. So, uh, no. yeah, <laughs> I think you're pretty it, okay. On, I mean, I mean might... overall, overall, I mean, yes, I, I can nitpick. Sure. There's yeah, if, right. if it, I tell you what, if it were my theater behind the curtains, I would put uh, some panels right behind okay. the main speakers. I would put in, you know, maybe one or both of the back corners, some corner trapping. That's what I would do in my theater. Okay. I'd, I'd rather have a little extra corner trapping than mm. not. 
that being said, if you said that this is what you were going to do and this is all you're going to do, I'd be like, that's you're doing a lot more than everybody else. Right. So you're doing fine. Yeah, overall, I'm, I'm very much in agreement. Since you're making the panels yourself anyway, I might put a panel behind your center speaker because we know the center speaker is going to be like the Pioneer sure. Andrew Jones center speaker. So just so that all three of your front speakers have some absorption behind them, that would make sense to me. Uh, and that wouldn't be a huge, you're talking about one extra panel over what you already described yeah. so uh and it could be a I, that probably wouldn't be a printed panel right the one behind your center speaker that'd be as plain yeah, just, as you could yeah. make it so i yeah. i would do that so rob's specific equipment recommendations were pretty close to a lot of the items greg already had in mind so he was happy to hear that what about my equipment recommend oh that's right <laughs> he had initially budgeted more for the projector so he, he'd be happy if the ben q uh for 950 works out he's never owned a projector before and the talk about dlp rainbow scared him into considering only considering uh epson lcd projectors is a whole rainbow thing really nothing to worry about okay i i am going to say yes <laughs> there's nothing to worry about Yes, Techn it is nothing to worry about. Okay. Technically, there is a chance that right. you might be one of those people who sees it. I have seen oodles of DLP projectors. I have never seen a rainbow. Mm. Clint, uh, when I was working with him, occasionally would say he could see rainbows, mm -hmm. but he hadn't said that since like DLPs were first released. Right. So I am... I am going to go out on a limb and say definitively, it is nothing to worry about. But, you know, keep your receipt. <laughs> so just to explain what the DLP rainbow thing is for anyone who might not be familiar, uh, the way single chip DLP projectors like this one work is that they actually have a spinning color wheel that goes red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. So for the color of each frame... It sequences through red, green, blue. So it's actually flashing red, green, blue one after another as opposed to having three individual panels right. or three individual sub-pixels like you would have on a flat panel showing those three colors simultaneously. It's actually sequencing them one after another using that one DLP panel to show you your red, green, blue in sequence for each frame. Now, if you only did red, green, blue for each frame once, that would be called a one times color wheel. It's spinning only fast enough that you get the sequence of red, green, blue once for each frame. So 60 times a second, uh, each frame is getting red, green, blue. Well, the HT2050A from BenQ is a six times color wheel. So you're getting the sequence of red, green, blue six times per frame. And that makes the likelihood of seeing rainbows exceedingly low. Um, I mean... There, there will be some people who claim it, but I think they're just making it up. It's, I, I think they're tricking themselves. Yeah, I think they, it's they nigh impossible it's a, it's a, with a, with yeah. a six-time speed color wheel to uh, to ever see rainbows. So um, it's not that nobody could ever see DLP rainbows. At the very beginning when they were one-times color wheels, lots of people saw rainbows. Yeah. But, it's the same thing. I mean, I tell you what, dude. You, I didn't hear you talk about screen door effect, which is what you, right. you know people used to complain about with LCDs. They sure did. So... The, you're not. You don't seem to be worried about screen door effects. So if you're worried, <laughs> if you're worried about rainbows, you got to be worried about screen door. In which case, you can't buy either one of these. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, honestly, it's nothing to no. worry about with this particular BenQ HD 2050 with a six times speed color wheel. Rainbows are nothing to worry about. He knows that Epson does offer refurbished projectors from time to time. If he finds a great deal in a refurb model, should he consider that, or is it best to stay away from refurbished when it comes to projectors? Uh, as long as it's a you know, as it's got the factory warranty, it's an mm -hmm. authorized dealer. I got no problems with refurbished. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that there's a brand new light bulb in there. Yep. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm. And I want to make sure about. it doesn't have any stuck pixels, because yeah. uh, very often, uh, again, like most refurbished things, it's probably a customer return, and they like all displays that have individual pixels they usually allow for a certain number of stuck or uh non-functioning pixels you know might be three might be eight might be 15 whatever the number the manufacturer says but they usually allow for some and it can be annoying if you have a few stuck pixels so uh i'm not super hype but given that you can get the the ht 2050 for sure for 950 and probably less if you call these porters there's not much incentive to me to go refurbished yeah so he'd really prefer to wall mount his surround speaker. So he initially budgeted a bit more to get a pair of NHT uh, Super Zeros. But Rob suggested a pair of Pioneer Andrew Jones bookshelf speakers to match his Pioneer Towers and center. Can those be wall, wall mounted? Maybe using wall mounts with a side clamp design. Will they be a problem since they have a rear port? I mean, you could wall mount anything. <laughs> try, try hard enough. Uh, okay, so 
the rear port, you know, it's going to be basically firing into the wall as the concern there. I don't know that I'd be worried so much about it, to be honest with you. I mean, you could put a little bit of, you know, I mean, you could actually just, I mean, wall mount, just put it on the shelf. I mean, yes, you know, yes, put it, put it just <laughs> make a little just, shelf. I mean, and, if you're handy enough to build a riser, you're handy enough to install a shelf. Yeah, just put, I, that's all I would do. I put a little shelf, I put it up yep. there, I, you know, get the the orientation right. And if I was really worried about the the port blowing into the wall back there, I take a little bit of insulation, a little bit of insulation, put, little put panel. Little panel back behind it right there, yeah. and that'd be it. That yeah, would be it. I agree, and I will also say I wouldn't even worry about it because your like crossover is gonna take care of that. Yeah. In your AV receiver. So no, this is nothing to worry about. Um if if you really want a specific wall mount, then yeah, I think the side clamping design one works because the uh the pioneer Andrew Jones bookshelf speakers, they're not tiny physically. Yeah. Um they're not super duper heavy. And if you really but... want the NHTs Go yeah. for it, you know, because they're he's working with a tight budget. So yeah, they're gonna um, they're gonna match just fine with the mm -hmm. Pioneer Jones, I think. Oh sure, uh, as surrounds, so, yeah, that'd be no yeah, problem. I, I wouldn't worry about that, but I mean, you, you don't have to. And plus, yeah. a shelf is you know a little piece of plywood with some paint on it, you know, and a couple of you know brackets. It's like yeah, I, you know, I agree. If, if you're handy enough to to do all this other DIY stuff, yeah, in, install yeah. a couple shelves on either side and put your bookshelves up there and don't even worry about it. He also looked at elite screens and the Loon Vision options for the projector screen. Best Buy, East, Sport, East Porters, and Costco all have all have sales in the Loon Vision uh, Lara fixed frame screens from time to time, bringing the price down into the three to four hundred dollar range for the hundred twenty inch side. Would that be worth it over the elite screens model? This is a fixed fixed frame. Fixed frame. And how far away is he sitting again? Again, do we remember? Uh, I don't remember the exact distance, but we were looking between one twenty and one thirty five. But one thirty five I mean, starts to make it tough on his budget. Right. So, I mean, I, I know the Loon Vision, we sometimes recommend those for people. Well, I really who, like them for their acoustically transparent. Yeah, and for I the really transparent. like them if you need an ambient light rejecting screen. I think they have the best ambient light rejecting screen, but it's expensive and he doesn't uh, need it here. I, I mean, I don't think that they're any better. Those fixed frames are any better than. But yeah, for the, the standard white, yeah. meh. Six yeah. of one, half I'd go with, of the other. I'd go with whatever's cheapest. Yep. Yep. Uh, not only that, again, if you're handy enough to build a. The build a riser. I'm thinking you're handy enough to make a frame, because for 125 bucks you can get the 135 inch screen material with a black backing from Amazon.ca. That's Elite Screens version of their Cine White screen. But you can get just the screen fabric, and then you make your own frame for like you know 175 dollars once you include the cost of materials to make the frame. Can't beat that. And you can get the larger size. Yeah. That's the way I'd lean. I'd go DIY on this green man. So he really likes the Denon X3400H receiver B-stock suggestion. He's really not looking to do an Atmos stuff. Definitely not right now anyway. His wife really does not want him cutting holes in the ceiling. So in-ceiling speakers wouldn't be an option anyway. But if he did, ever decided to give Atmos a try, is there a cheap on-ceiling speaker we'd recommend? The Focal Little Birds aren't easy to get a hold of in Canada. True. On-ceiling. On-ceiling. Mounted on the ceiling. Well, cheap is harder to do because I was going to say that he was already looking at the NHTs and those would be yes. small and go up there very easily. And not crazy expensive, but... The, the, I mean, that would be my probably my first recommendation. Yeah. I would keep an eye out for sales on those guys. Yeah. But on, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, you know, it's just Atmos. <laughs> Honestly, if he's yeah. going with an X3400H, in his room size with the two rows of seats, I'd install surround backs before I'd install anything on the ceiling. Yeah. Because you point. could actually benefit from surround backs in this in this setup. And keep in mind, 7.1 with no overhead speakers is still an Atmos configuration. It'll still move objects around you as long as you have yeah. 7.1 so that's kind of what i would do and that's just another pair of pioneer andrew jones bookshelf speakers on a shelf that you mount on your back wall yourself that's that's what i would do um if you really want to do the ceiling thing um so normally for anyone who can't get focal little birds my suggestion is to get kef's e301 uh mm. satellite speakers because they're a similar form factor but you can you can absolutely get them in canada but they're 350 dollars for the pairs so that's doesn't fit the cheap criteria yeah. What about RBH? Don't they have those little satellite ones too? Do they they ship to Canada? Don't they? Uh, you got to pay all the shipping and border fees and crap yeah. like that. So, 
Yeah, it doesn't end up. I don't think they're selling their E series from RBH anymore. I think those went mm. away. Um, now, I mean, you could go with like Andy's suggestion from a couple of weeks ago. Amazon sells the uh, what? Are the, what, what is it? Acoustic Audio is the brand, and it's their AA three two one tiny little stupid looking cube speakers for uh, fifty bucks in Canada. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if those are even worth 50 bucks. Andy was like, hey, they sound better than I expected them to. But I'm like, yeah, but you paid like $30 for them. So what were you expecting initially? <laughs> Probably not much. Probably not a lot. So exceeding those you were, you were, you were You were excited that they made noise at it's, all? <laughs> it's all relative. Right. <laughs> so, But honestly, I just go 7.1 if you're going to do more than 5.1 in here. That's what I would suggest. Yeah. Infinite Gary. In Gary's theater, he auditioned several different center speakers, including Dyn uh, the Dynaudio Center from the same series as his uh, front Dynaudio Towers. In the end, he settled on a Re Revel Ultima Center. Why can I not talk today? I don't know. And even though he, there are different brands, he finds the timbre matched in the overall cohesiveness cohesiveness to be excellent, and he did not arrive at that decision lightly. But the expert advice... Oh my we go Re uh, remains that you should always buy matching speakers especially the front three get three fronts in the center from the same brand and ideally from the same series and even more ideal would be th three truly identical speakers on the horizontal center paired with a vertical uh, front left right so seemingly he didn't end up following any of that expert advice he's got a horizontal center from a different series and a different brand and yet that is what got him the best results so does he know better than the experts or was this just the, an exception it's not. It's not even. I'll be honest with you, dude. It's not even an exception. Mm. <laughs> there, I have. I have paired RBH center speakers with so many different other tower speakers, mm -hmm. and never had a problem. Uh, one exception was. Uh, oh, what was that speaker? I don't remember what speaker brand it was, but they weren't neutral. Right. They weren't. A, they weren't a more. You know, they weren't a more flat brand. They were going for a sound, mm -hmm. and it did not pair well with. Uh, I think it might have been Elemental Designs. Uh, it did not pair well with uh, the RBH. That was the only time I ever mm -hmm. noticed uh, a difference between them. Now, the reason why we say, and 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 if if I can tentatively lump myself up with these experts that you put in quotes in every one of your little things, uh, is that the reason why we say this, because we know timbre matching will not be an issue if you get three speakers that are exactly the same. We are right. also more confident that your timbre matching is not going to be an issue if you get three from the same series from the same manufacturer. We're pretty confident of that. We're less confident, but still feeling pretty good about you buying all your speakers from the same manufacturer, even if they're not from the same series, because manufacturers tend to have speakers that sound similar, mm -hmm. more similar than dissimilar. When you start mixing and matching brands, then it's the wild, wild west. And we have no idea. You're like, yeah, go out there and grab a golden ear center channel and throw <laughs> right, it in right. here and see how that matches. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I'm not bashing golden ear. Golden ear match just fine with other golden ear speakers. Mm -hmm. They just don't match well with necessarily the ones that you have. So, Saying that, you know, you've somehow bucked the trend or whatever, you, you, okay, yeah. It's like going to your doctor and they tell you you got to brush your teeth or your dentist, you got to brush your teeth three times a day. You know, I mean, you're not going to die. <laughs> your teeth aren't going to fall out of your head if you don't brush them three, time a three times a day. You should try to brush your teeth as often as possible, but, you know, it, it's a recommendation that they know works. I know what works. Well, we know what works when it comes to timbre matching in your front three speakers. Those are the ones you're most sensitive to. Those are the ones we're most concerned about. You know, there's a lot of people, experts out there, that'll say you should timbre match all the way around. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what Rob did in his theater, right? Because he Completely knew... Completely unnecessary behind me and above me. Yeah, but he did it. <laughs> he did it. Yep. But it's not necessary. And, you know, I mean, so saying that... Uh, you know, the, the, some sort of exception. It's not. I think it's, especially as you get higher up in some of these speaker manufacturers, you know, they're all going for accurate, you know, sound for the most part. You know, there are some speaker manufacturers out there that are still trying to get their signature sound. B&W is probably one of them, Bang & Olufsen, mm -hmm. for sure. You know, they're going for their specific sounds. But as you go up the, these lines, you know, they the speakers start to sound more similar than dissimilar. Uh, they just have different characteristics that you may or may not like. Aesthetics, you know, how much, how loud they can play, uh, you know, what their form factor is, these other things. So, you know, I think you're doing fine, Gary. And the fact oh, that happens, you, yes. you, you're, you're, you've got three speakers that sound good to you is the end of the discussion. It really is, yeah. No, I mean, just because... So, 
for anyone who is trying to offer advice, and this certainly applies to us, I mean, we can't go into every specific scenario every time we answer a question. We're, we're going to make generalizations, yeah. and, and anybody offering advice is going to do that, especially if it's just like on a panel or something, somebody's saying, okay, what's an important thing that not everybody thinks about? And they're going to go, oh, well, one thing is making sure they have a nice timbre match across the front three, and one way to, uh, you know, have a higher likelihood of that is by getting, you know, matching ones. I, 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 ideally three identical ones, but if you can't do that, you know, matching ones from the same series, from the same brand. Like that's throwing out the advice in a way that is a generalization, but will far more often than not work out nicely. Right. right? It's not saying that you can never have a scenario where they don't have matching series from the same brand and it's going to be awful every time because of that. No, it's not. It's not that. It's not the reverse of that. It's uh, it's a generalization versus a specific. So he's been trying out various phono gear, so, you know, records and stuff. Mm -hmm. Naturally, that comes with reading lots of reviews and marketing speak. Th those are the same things. <laughs> Whenever you're talking about <laughs> phono <laughs> gear. But one thing that keeps cropping up is talking about details, where it's like extracting the finest details or retrieving details keep being used. So what exactly are these details that are being extracted or revealed? Uh, retrieved, I'm sorry. This is the things that were scratched away by the needle. <laughs> <laughs> The things that you can hear very clearly on the CD because it didn't get scratched away by a needle. That's what it is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it is it is mostly marketing fluff. Yeah. I mean, often Not just marketing fluff. It's just, I have to, this is a review. It needs to be about 3,000 words long. I need to write some right, more right, words. Right. Here are some words that people like to read. The retrieving detail it's and extracted the detail clarity. off of the vinyl record like like no other phono cartridge could that's why you oh spend, right yeah because your needle is magic needle with unicorn horn why you should spend stuff. thirty thousand dollars just on your cartridge yeah uh yeah there's that kind of nonsense that's going on in the phono world um yeah it's often either high frequency stuff that's common or it's quiet things that are often masked by the inherent noise of a photo setup and so if you can reduce the noise if you can reduce the the regular i was gonna say record, we should do, we should answer this question like this here you go you, you answer the question right yeah so yes if you can uh, reduce the noise then you can hear details that would otherwise be masked by the inherent noise of uh, spinning a vinyl record and having a needle physically scratch across its surface yeah so uh details Quiet things, higher frequencies, that's usually what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to hear that. Or you can just play the CD. Up to you. All right, Ryan. Ryan is looking for a second option. Or no, opinion. I'm sorry. I, I, I read it first as opinion and went, ha, I'm not going to get me this time. And, I'm gonna, and then uh, they got me. He purchased, a, he purchased a Vizio P-Series Quantum TV because it was less expensive than the OLED. But a lot of reviews says it's the... Uh, and a lot of reviews say say it's the best LCD TV for the money, only uh, with only the much more expensive flagship Samsungs and Sonys being a bit better. So he really wants to love it, but it's not OLED. It is. He not. walks. He watches a ton of sports and a lot of movies, and he's seen some dirty screen effect, as well as one flaw that a lot of reviews point out, which is some fairly obvious color banding now and then. This is the same thing that bothered Lee, right? This uh, TV purchase is meant to be uh, to last a long time. He decided to return the Vizio Quantum and splurge on. Oh, wait a second, the color banding was the OLED that 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 we were talking well, about. Well, that's in the very very dark. You can get some vertical yeah. banding. In fact, you will get some vertical banding in the very very dark of an OLED. But in the brighter section of the images, it's very uniform. Where this dirty screen effect comes from in LCDs is slightly uneven backlighting which mm. shows up mostly in the brightest images. And when you have a moving image that's very bright going across an LCD, you will notice this very slight variance in the uh, backlight not being perfectly even. And that makes it look like the, your screen is a little bit dirty is kind of what it looks like. So that's where that name dirty screen effect comes from. OLEDs don't have that. OLEDs have the reverse problem where in the very, very darks, there will be a, some, some vertical streaks. It's unavoidable on OLEDs right now. 
This TV purchased Smith in the last long time, so he's decided to re return the Vizio Quantum and splurge on the OLED, which is what he truly wanted in the first place. But now he needs to know exactly which model of OLED, OLED to get. Going back to review, Sony keeps getting praise for their motion handling and uh, gradation smoothing, but the Sony OLEDs cost more than the LGs. On the LG size, the C8 is barely more expensive than the B8, and the C8 is supposed to be to offer gradation smoothing hidden within the MPEG noise reduction menu, of course. Mm -hmm. So which specific OLED should he get? I think it's the B7. <laughs> oh, well, there's the, that. Yeah. I think that's the, because we talked about this already. It's B7. But I mean, okay. So uh, <laughs> I, he, he should get an OLED. Okay. Yes. Because I think in the end, he, it's what he want, he wanted and he will never be happy with the LCD no matter what we yeah. say. But And there's more than these. Th I mean, it's just the, it's that perfect black. When you're what he said, watch a lot of movies. I bet a lot of them have black bars. And on an OLED, those black bars are so black, you cannot tell them apart from the extremely thin but black bezel. Like you literally cannot tell the screen apart from the bezel. Right. Whereas on LCDs, you'll always see that little bit of black bar above and below. Right. And, you know, I, I think you should get the OLED yeah. regardless. But, you know, especially when you're watching a lot of uh, sports, unless you are watching it over the air, you know, you're, there's going to be issues with your your sports. At least I have yet to have seen a sports broadcast that was either over satellite or cable. Now, I have never seen Fios. So mm -hmm. maybe you've got fiber optic, in which case maybe you are in the minority that gets, you know, really great bandwidth and you know your grass doesn't look like it sparkles the whole time <laughs> you know? but uh i cannot watch i have a, such a hard time watching sports uh over uh on, on a on the cable network anymore because mm. of how poorly uh it's compressed so you know just because you get this new tv do not think that your sports are suddenly going to look you know, like looking through a window. Right, one hundred percent pristine. Yeah, there's you always still have some, other issues. Yeah, little artifacts. Yeah, yeah. The Sony's they certainly do get praise for the motion handling. I, I, I always end up turning it off because I mean, as much as they say, oh, it it, 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 it's you have to turn on motion flow. That's Sony's name for it to get the thing. And uh, and all the reviews are like, oh, it's the it's the minimal amount of soap opera effect. I'm like. Yeah, but there's still some, and that still <laughs> bothers me. Like, I still see it. So I end up always turning it off. Um, so really, I, I actually agree with Tom. It, for most people, it's going to be a B7, because you can still get those, and they cost less, but they're mm. from 2017. I would only go for the C8. I, so I wouldn't get a B8 over a B7, because they're identical, <laughs> even right. though they're different model years. So the only reason to go for a C8 is if... You really, really want that gradient smoothing, and it is hidden underneath the MPEG noise reduction menu, but it does that. And if you really, really want the option of black frame insertion, because the C8s also do that. And that, if you're like, I've got to have the cleanest motion, then black frame insertion does that without introducing any soap opera effect. Mm. Uh, so if you really want those two features, I could justify a C8, Otherwise, yeah, get a B7 and save the money. Okay. There, that's our second opinion. Nick. Nick is in the huge open floor plan, so he's going to upgrade to a pair of very high output subwoofers. He's happy to do the research on, he's happy to do the research on specific models himself using uh, database.com. He's looking at the CEA 2010 measurements and whatnot. So specific model recommendation is not the request here. Instead, he's got some questions about Odyssey. Mm -hmm. He's come across claims that Odyssey might cut or boost as much as 9 dB within its EQ range. Is that correct? Is Odyssey's EQ potentially cutting or boosting plus or minus 9 dB? Um, first of all, I, I, did he say why he cares? Because I don't know why he cares. <laughs> Well, Is that's coming. It's coming up in a future question. Why? Okay. Cares, well, I'll let exactly you answer. The, I'll let you because I don't know the answer to this question. So, I'll let you answer that, and then we'll get to the the why he cares part because that's the part I care about. Sure. So, uh, Audioholics did an interview directly with uh, Chris Kiriakakis, who is the founder of Odyssey, and in that uh, uh, interview. Chris Kiriakakis himself said it, they allow for a plus nine decibel boost. That's the maximum. So the, the nine decibel figure is correct, but they will allow for as much as a negative 20 decibel cut. So if you have a big, big peak somewhere in your room, it's allowed to cut as much as 20 decibels, but it'll never boost more than nine. So that's straight from the horse's mouth. 
So within the frequency, uh, what within what frequency range is the EQ being applied? Could Odyssey boost as much as nine dB all the way down to twenty hertz? Will it EQ below twenty hertz? Now, first of all, the fact that you can see how much they're allowing it to boost versus how much they're allowing it to cut shows you what they're more likely to do mm -hmm. to begin with. Boosting is almost always about it. Not, I mean, just it's so rarely helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you got if you got small dips that are like the small dips might be because of the subwoofer itself. It's not a room right. related issue. The subwoofer right. is just not perfectly linear right. and a small two decibel boost or something could get you back to linear that no and problem. And we've talked with that. about this multiple times, which is, you know, boosting a null oh, or trying to boost within your a room problem doesn't change anything. Mm. You know, the, the more you boost it, the more it cancels itself out and it doesn't <laughs> do anything. So the boosts are to correct what the subwoofer is doing. The cuts are to correct what the room is doing. Mm. If you think that's of it that way. That's one way to think of it, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's the way I think of it. So caring about how much it's boosting or cutting, mm. you know. But it, we it, have to admit, I mean, it, 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 once you have, what, when you take that measurement, it does attempt to make it as linear as it can, it will boost if it yeah. sees a dip in the frequency response. So we, we can't say that just because what we would do manually, right? We, right. we do have to admit it, it could be boosting as much as nine decibels. So again, from that same interview, and this is a direct quote from Chris Kiriakakis, he says, multi-EQ is capable of applying corrections from 10 hertz up to 24 kilohertz. So it can EQ below 20 hertz. However, during the measurement process, it first determines the roll-off points of each speaker and subwoofer, and it limits the correction below that point. So it's going to see how far your subwoofer can play down fairly linearly on its own. And once it says, oh, here's where it's, you know, minus 3 dB or minus 6 dB, I'm not going to keep EQing below that point because it just can't keep playing anymore. That's the natural roll off of the speaker right. or subwoofer at that point. So the last thing you want to do is try to try to boost up frequencies that can't play anyways. Exactly, it's, yeah. it's just going to make, it's either going to make noise or damage the speaker. So but if your sub can play flat all the way down to 10 hertz, it, it'll EQ all the way down to 10 hertz. There you go. So if he looks for a subwoofer model that can play 9 dB louder than his desired output level, well, that will be ideal, correct? That way it could, it could be set to output his desired SPL. And then even if Odyssey deems it necessary to boost as much as 9 dB at certain frequencies, in order to achieve flat frequency response, he'd have the headroom available to do that, correct? I mean, how do you know what your desired output is? I mean, no, I guess... I mean, you, you can know. You, you can figure know it out. Like. Yep. Yeah. And he does. He's very so, into these figures. I can see that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, technically, I guess you are correct. I'm not... Sure. I, the, the, that math works out. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not going to boost any more than 9. So you want 9 dB of headroom from where you are sitting. So yes, that's correct. Yeah, as 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 stated, that that is factually correct. I would not worry about it. <laughs> I've I've never seen a subwoofer measured by database where like even if you send it a signal that it can't really handle like they all just kind of kind of level it off. Right. I've never seen one that like well, I don't know. I guess it's possible. We we have seen subwoofers bottom themselves out, but the type of yeah. subs you're talking not about, not the ones you're looking at. <laughs> yeah, they're so well protected that. Yeah. yeah, not the not the high output subwoofers. The and, subwoofers that bottom themsel themselves out have six inch drivers in itty bitty cabinets, and or, it costs a hundred bucks. And if Odyssey is seeing a large enough dip that it's applying a nine decibel boost, well, that's probably not just the subwoofer itself. That is probably a room problem, and boosting the signal probably isn't going to fix it. So. So you are you are correct as stated, but my real answer is I wouldn't be so concerned about it. It would be nice to have a little bit of headroom. It would be nice to not get a sub that can reach exactly the SPL level that you're trying to reach and has nothing extra at all. I would be I would be surprised if you could even find that. Anyways. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so having some headroom is good, but I wouldn't like. For example, if you find a subwoofer that fits all of your criteria, but it only has seven decibels extra headroom, like. I would not say, oh, I can't possibly get that because it's not nine. I, I wouldn't be that strict about it. No, me neither. Yeah. Different topic. He says, Rob has been talking up active HDR quite a bit over the last few weeks. You have? I have. And Nick has inferred that if a system is has good dynamic tone mapping, where it basically ignores any HDR metadata and just analyzes the video signal itself and adjusts the tone mapping on the time uh, in real time on the fly, that's just as good or maybe even better than the dynamic metadata HDR systems like Dolby Vision or HDR10+. Is that all just theory or is it based on real-world experience? Have any professional reviewers checked this with side-by-side -side comparison? 
I am absolutely sure somebody has. Yep. Vincent Dio has over at HGTV Test. And if you check right. out his most recent review of the Sony A9F Master Series OLED, uh, he actually points out how, for whatever reason, uh, the way that the A9F is handling Dolby Vision right now, it looks darker than it ought to. This is something that they're going to attempt to fix with a firmware update, but right now Dolby Vision looks darker than it than it should. Uh, whereas the A9F uses Sony's version of dynamic tone mapping, where it'll take an HDR10 signal, ignore the metadata, just look at the signal on the fly and adjust itself uh, you know, on a frame by frame basis. And he's like, yeah, that looks better. So if you have the opportunity at the moment, turn Dolby Vision off and just send the HDR10 signal. And I've looked at it myself on my B7 LG OLED, which has active HDR, in that case, hidden underneath the dynamic contrast control. Right. But there it is. And so when I'm backing up my Ultra HD Blu-rays, I only end up with HDR10, even if it's a Dolby Vision disc. There's no way to back up discs right now and retain the Dolby Vision on them. And I'm looking at those side by side. I'm like, you know what? I, I kind of prefer the TV just doing it itself. It, now, it never ends up looking too dark that way. I, I would say that uh, for all you people in YouTube land mm -hmm. who are watching this video in the future. Oh, this could change. This is not could change. I will pretty much guarantee you that, you know, a year from now, maybe less, all these TVs are suddenly going to start doing this right. You know, right yep. now, Dolby Vision and HDR10 and 10 Plus and all that stuff, all that stuff is brand new. So, you know, they're trying to figure out their implementations. They're updating their firmware. They're doing all this stuff. And right now, it's a lot easier for them to basically bypass all that and just kind of do it manually because the TV knows right. what it can do right well that's going to change and it's going to get to the point where we're going to start recommending that you turn all that stuff off and you just let dolby vision do its dolby vision thing yeah. and say hdr10 I mean, do its hdr10 the thing. theoretical advantage of dolby vision is that it's dolby that's in charge of what that tone mapping curve should be right it's not up to the manufacturers whereas something like active hdr i mean the way sony does it is slightly different than the way lg does it because there's no standard for them to adhere to right. they're like this right. is how we've decided to actively tone map that is up to the manufacturer so theoretically dolby vision should be more consistent it's just that we have lots of real world examples where it's not being implemented perfectly right now and we're having to wait on not only the manufacturers to release firmware updates but for Dolby to work with them to create the firmware right. updates in the first place and there seems to be kind of a backlog on right. getting this stuff fixed and once once this gets fixed I mean and all you people who are already you know already pressed send on your you guys are so stupid <laughs> comments on YouTube uh, we we know yes. thanks Thanks for, I mean, thanks. once we get to televisions that can just spit out 10,000 nits, you won't have yeah. to tone map anything at all. That's so, right. Yeah. Just remember, patreon.com slash AV <laughs> All right. Josh. Josh wants a clearer understanding about how much greater the sound pressure level will be when adding more subwoofers in a room and his research on the internet and in forums is only money in the waters and making things more confusing. Uh -huh. He sort of say that adding a second subwoofer will increase the SPL by 3 dB. Other places we've said that increase the SPL by 6 dB, but further reading seems to indicate that you only get 6 dB if the two subwoofers are, are coupled, meaning they're basically stacked or directly side by side. But then even more research has suggested that the 6 dB coupling effect will take place as long as two subwoofers are within one quarter of the wavelength of the sound wave being produced. So let's look at a 20 hertz, which has a wavelength around 56 feet, so it's a quarter wavelength is roughly 14 feet so if you got two subwoofers in a room and they're quite far apart but less than 14 feet they'd be creating a 6 db increase in the spl down to 20 hertz due to this coupling effect is that correct but when at higher frequencies those shorter wavelengths you might only get the 3 db spl in, uh, spl increase versus one sub For, again that's a question at the end i just didn't state it as such um this is a rob question so. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, yes, we are again, once again, we're dealing with uh, generalization, generalization versus very specific. Yeah. Um, because, so the real world answer is none of these numbers are ever going to be perfectly consistent. But we always say about 3 dB. Anyways, about right? about 6 dB if you stack them. Theoretically. <laughs> because even if your room is supposedly a perfect rectangle, it isn't because nobody makes 100% flat walls, 100% square. And even if it were 100% uh, flat, the consistency of the reflections off of whatever the surface of your wall is made of is not 
perfectly uniform. So we never get the exact theoretical results in the real world. So it's always going to be approximately, roughly. But as stated, uh, yes, your information is correct. Uh, you will get a theoretical plus six decibel boost by stacking or having two subs side by side. And you are correct that as long as they are within one quarter of the wavelength that they are both playing, that you should theoretically get this coupling effect. But all sorts of things can alter the real world results because you can perfectly imagine a situation where uh, you have two subwoofers, they're six feet apart, so they're some distance apart. They're not directly stacked or directly side by side, but they're six feet apart from each other, which means that for uh, frequencies up to, I don't know, I didn't figure out exactly what wavelength that would be, but it'd be above 20 hertz, um, that you should have this coupling effect going on for all the frequencies that uh, have a wavelength longer than four times six feet, longer than 24 feet. All the frequencies that are longer than 24 feet should get this coupling effect, but you can still end up with all sorts of wave interactions because you have three dimensions to your room, even in a perfect rectangle. Right. That's going to create up all kinds of wave interactions that are happening, and you're only in one spot where you're listening. So it's not as though all of those frequencies are going to arrive exactly plus six decibels versus what they were with just one subwoofer. You're going to have all this wave interaction going on. So theoretically, if you had no walls, this is what would happen, Right. <laughs> But right. you do have walls. So real world, you don't get this. So when you're trying to get into the specifics of uh, how do I work out exactly how much I'm going to get, you end up having to measure because it never comes down to what it would be if you were in a situation where you had no walls because you do have walls. All right. Yeah. So, it, so it, that, it's a bit that, tough. That distance you're talking about, that 14 feet, that's in a, a vacuum. Floating out well, of space. Not a know. vacuum, but a, a wallless yeah. scenario. A wall-less you, you need scenario. air because in a vacuum, you'd have well, no yeah, sound yeah, yeah, at yeah. all. <laughs> what I'm saying is that in a big empty space, like in floating. In a big empty yeah, space, yes. Yeah, 14 feet away. But you're not, yeah. you know, that if your room's 14 feet wide and you've got them 14 feet away, there is a wall right there. It's immediately bouncing yeah, and now, off yeah, of and everything. Exactly. Now you're getting a boundary reinforcement effect, yeah. which he's going to get into a little bit here as well. Yeah. So yeah, figuring out the exact... It is complicated. I can, Absolutely, it's confusing. But the numbers you're that, specifying... Yeah, but that's why we use this sort of shorthand of, uh, you know, if they're not on top of each other, it's 3 dB. If they are on top of it, it's 6 dB. It's not exactly that. Because no, you, and, and because... At, at different frequencies, you will get different results, right? And yeah. you're going to have the scenario where you have two subs across the room from each other. You're sitting in a particular seat, and at some frequency, you've got a big old hump still. That can absolutely still happen even with the subwoofers across from each other. So that's not a plus 3 dB boost at that particular frequency. It could be way more than that. But we're saying in an overall, in a generalized sense, mm -hmm. if your subwoofers are not stacked on top of each other, if they're not quite close to each other, because we're talking about a, there's a lot of frequencies that are shorter wavelengths. You know, if you're only thinking about 20 hertz, where the quarter wavelength is 14 feet, I mean, all the frequencies above that, and your sub is playing all the way up to 160 hertz. Because even though it's a crossover, it's still playing up to 160 hertz. So you've got a lot of frequencies. So unless they're stacked or side by side, uh, you're mostly going to be getting around plus three decibels if they're far apart from each other. So, do I have to do this next one? Because it seems like we're just beating a dead horse. Uh, just to be clear, in a right. large room with two subs more than 14 feet apart, you'd only be getting a 3 dB increase versus one sub over the entire audible frequency range. I mean, yeah. Yeah, again, in yeah. a general sense. In general sense. Yes, yeah. So, reading up on room, room modes, he's come across the term modal range. Mm -hmm. Is he understanding correctly that the modal range is unique for each room based on its dimension? Yes. He seems to explain that in a small room, there will actually be frequencies that are below the modal range, and that below the modal range, you'll get an SPL gain of 6 dB, while within the modal range, the SPL increase or decrease will vary. So, what does that mean uh, to subpositioned within a quarter wavelength of uh, the frequency is that is below the room's modal, ma uh, modal range? We'll be getting a 12 dB SPL increase. Um, I mean, this is you're, what you're talking about right there is uh, room modes, right? So, modes, you know, yes. just what Rob just said, you could be sitting there and getting not just 12, 
you could be getting even more than plus 12 at, at a some seat. Frequencies, at some frequencies. At some frequencies. the resonant w frequency of your room. If you've got, let's say you have uh, walls that are all factors of each other. So it's uh, uh, 12 feet wide, 24 feet long, mm. and 6 feet tall. Yes, right? like this on top of it, yes. Right? You put all that together, and suddenly, you know, <laughs> there's going to be some frequencies where you're going to be getting like... The, it, all, Every dimension of the room is going to uh, boost, give you a boost or, or or a peak at that at that frequency, mm -hmm. and it is going to be insane. Like you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna cover your ears when you get to that frequency. You're gonna think it's so bad. So, you know, it, it's so much more complicated than us being able to say yes or no to some of these questions that you've got. Right. And here. I mean, that, hence the confusion, right? Because yeah. he's trying to distill it down to I understand what the numbers will be, but. I mean, our real answer is that in a in an actual room, you can never know 100% what the exact numbers are going to be across the entire audible frequency. You have to know. You have you to ha measure it. First, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's say if you wanted to know for sure, it would have to be an empty room where you knew where you knew exactly the resonant, you know, the, the exact dimensions. You would know have to know exactly the, the comp composition of all the materials on the floor and the ceiling. Mm. And then you could program those with nothing other than the subwoofers in there. <laughs> then you could probably program it and say, I know for sure. Now, mm. the minute you put a chair in there, it's different. The right. minute you put some room treatments in there, it's different. The minute that you start adding a uh, carpet, it's different. The minute, you know, you put popcorn on the ceiling, it's different. You know, it like everything that you do to it is going to make a change. So you... When Rob says you can never know, it's not entirely true. You can sure, know. Okay. It's, it, 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 if you build a steel box, I guarantee you there is a there is a, uh, a, a, a engineer out there that can that can tell you for sure, you know what exactly the the dB boost will be at every single frequency based on the location of the subwoofers. But. but this notion of the modal range, uh, it is, it's unique to the dimensions of each room and uh, figuring on a rectangular room, uh, whatever is your longest dimension, uh, take that and double it. And that would be the wavelength of the frequency that will create your primary room mode. So if you think about what's happening, right? The uh, Imagine that the subwoofer is started with its driver drawn back into itself as far as it will ever be, right? So it begins to move out, which means the sound wave starts to move and it's moving out and it continues moving out and continues moving out. And once it reaches as far out as it will ever go, that's the exact moment when the sound wave reaches the wall of the room, right? So it bounces off of that wall and starts moving back at exactly the same time that the driver is moving back into itself. So the two of them are always in sync when the right. room is exactly half the length of the wavelength being produced that creates your primary mode. Now, below that frequency, there is no scenario where it's gonna be perfectly moving. I mean, until you get like so down into the infrasonic that there isn't anything there anymore. Um, so that is now below the modal range, right? Now the, the movement of the driver is never gonna be perfectly in sync with the bouncing of the sound wave once you're below that frequency so yes you can take whatever is the longest length uh longest dimension of your room double that that's your frequency uh where you'll have your primary mode and below that you are below the modal range and into what we now call room gain mm. because now you are always getting some additional sound hitting your eardrum that is due to reflections you cannot escape it you could you could put your sub embedded in the front wall and you could press your ear up against it. And no matter what you do, you will always end up getting hit by a reflected sound wave before one cycle of that wave has even completed. Because that's just the nature of it, which means you are always getting a boost. And that boost gets more and more and more the lower and lower you go in the frequency because that's giving it more time to bounce back and forth before it's completed even one cycle of itself. So that is this room gain that we talk about, which is why sealed subs that begin to roll off at a higher frequency but placed in a small sealed room can benefit from this room gain and have more and more output the lower and lower that they play. But the exact number is going to be very difficult to determine. So he says, can two lower output subwoofers end up having an equivalent output as one larger, higher output sub? For example, according to CEA 2010 measurements, the uh, SVS PB2000 can output 103.8 dB at 20 hertz, while the PB4000 can output 
8.3 dB at 20 hertz. So there's a difference. It's at 8.5 dB louder at mm -hmm. 20. But if you positioned two, and it says PB2000, uh, 4000, but I think it means 2000s. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Two, two yeah. PB2000s within 14 feet of each other, would they only be 2.5 dB quieter at the 20 hertz than a single PB4000? In a room with no walls. Yeah, I was going to say, the minute that you add the walls and then uh, suddenly you've got room gain again. We're back to room gain. You're back and, to room gain. You're it, back to interaction. I mean, remember, when I was talking about that whole modal thing, that only works in one dimension. You have to remember there's the other two dimensions of the room and the crosswise and angled reflections and all that. And once you actually see the real wave interaction in a room it's not just that the sound wave went straight across the room and bounced back and didn't right. go in any other direction it's not a laser all, all the other types of wave interactions that are going on so yes in a room with no walls that is 100 true the, the numbers that you just stated in a room with walls you might get significantly different results and it could actually be it, there is the scenario where two subwoofers playing a given frequency and you're at a certain seat in the room is quieter than one subwoofer. Yeah, definitely. That can happen because of all the wave interactions of all the dimensions. And in fact, all the a angles, lot of times that's what bouncing. we want to happen. Sure. <laughs> that's the whole idea is we're trying to get rid of those peaks. Yeah, all right, I mean, Rob. That one huge mode, right? You put That's why you put the two subs in the middle of the walls across from each other because they actually get rid of that one huge mode where it's just constantly doubling up on itself back and forth. That's right. So, Rob, uh, I got to go. It's okay. 30. So do we want to end here or are you going to continue on by yourself? Ooh, for a of you'd let me continue on? Well, I'm not going to lot let you, but, you know, <laughs> it gets a little weird <laughs> You're talking to yourself. Well, I, I'd, I'd be happy to because we do have 16 questions on the list, so I'd, I'd love to hit We're, two more if possible. All right, knock yourself out. So I will. With that, I am out. Well, Goodbye, people. wow, this is a first. I Watershed know. I moment. got. I mean, I, I feel bad because we had this. No, we no, had no, two short po podcasts in a row. Um, this <laughs> thing will not let me click on the window and go away. <laughs> is uh, it up at the top there? There's a little. No, handle? I have it. The 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 uh, a Chrome has a bunch of open tabs, and ah, then yes. upgrade to Mac OS Mojave because we would like to screw up everything on your computer. Yes, we would. Is up there, and I'm trying to hang up, but I can't hang up. Well, all right, I everybody. I could eject you from the call if that's you can. That's all right. I, 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 I got it. I got it. I got it. So uh, with that, I'm out. You guys have a great week, and I will see you guys next week. Whoa. Okay. We're bye not bye, getting. We're, this is a one-time only thing, Rob. I know, Don't get, I get used it. to it. All right. Bye. There. I've ejected Tom from the call. That's No, that's not, that's not true. He hung up on himself. All right. Well, I will carry on then solo for, uh, I think I'll try to get two more questions. So Ted M. Uh, Ted wants to finally get his projector in screen. When he bought his uh, three legacy silhouette on wall speakers, and we've mentioned these several times, and I'll show the image in the completed video once again. Um, yeah, he specifically got those with the idea that he would get an acoustically transparent projection screen, and that would be his setup. So he'd like that plan to finally come to fruition. Uh, this is still his 12 foot by 13 and a half foot room. And he's thinking he will have the screen on one of the 12 foot walls instead of on one of the 13 and a half foot walls, which is where he has his flat panel mounted right now. So he's gonna rotate his setup about 90 degrees, make the room a little bit longer than it is wide. His budget is $5,000 to get both the projector and the acoustically transparent fixed frame screen and uh, as well as whatever he would need to mount that screen and the room is fully light controlled so he's not looking for ambient light rejecting or anything like that but acoustically transparent for sure so what would we recommend as a nice combination for the screen size the acoustic transparency having excellent 4k and hdr image quality he's fine with wobble k uh, and have everything cost in total about $5,000 or less. Uh, he's saying it seems as though that JVC X790, which is going for about $4,000 right now, seems to be the popular choice, but would it be able to throw a large enough image uh, in this small room size and hit all the other things that he wants? So. Right off the bat, I will say that X790, uh, also known as the RS540, that is absolutely what I would point you to. As we know, AV Science will apparently sell it for $3,800, so we've got about $1,200 to play with to get the screen, and that's absolutely what I would point you to. Uh, let's figure out the screen size in here. Right now, he says he's sitting about seven and a half feet from eyes to screen, and he's got this... Uh, so we've got two rows of seats, but they're like right on top of each other. It's like a, a futon up on riser on a riser behind another futon. 
uh, essentially no space between those two things, but he's okay with that setup now. And if he's willing to keep essentially that same seating setup and from one of the other images, uh, it does look as though the door to this room is on what would end up being his back wall on in the on the left. So it'd be on the back wall on the left, I'm assuming is how he would set it up so that the screen could be on the full 12 foot wall on the other side. It does look as though that futon could fit uh, the, the back futon could fit beside the door. It might be a little off center this way, but it looks like it would be able to fit beside the door and he could keep the same more or less seating arrangement that he has now. So if in his 12 foot width right now, he's seven and a half feet away, here's what I'm thinking. First of all, he's going to need to have a false wall because he's going to have his legacy silhouette speakers mounted on the one of the 12 foot walls and you're going to have a false wall and i'm going to assume that once that's all constructed that false wall is going to have the screen itself being one foot in front of the physical front wall so now instead of the room appearing to be 13 and a half feet from front to back it's going to be appearing to be 12 and a half feet from front to back now he should be able to keep this same seating arrangement and end up with an eight foot distance from eyes to screen for that front row. Uh, that's what should work out if he kept the seating exactly what it, what it is, but just rotated the room 90 degrees. So with an eight foot seating distance, and he was like, uh, he tried the uh, going to an actual theater and counting the number of paces from the seat that he prefers up to the screen and then the number of paces across the screen. And he's like, he ended up with a 50 degree field of view and he thought that couldn't be right. He figured the field of view would be smaller, but that's entirely possible. Uh, a 50 degree field of view in a full size movie theater is, is would not be out of place at all uh, as a preference. Uh, I tend to prefer about 45 degree field of view at home. And he was like, oh, he could get the projector first, throw it up onto just the wall and make sure that he gets the screen size that he wants exactly. And that's exactly what I would recommend. But assuming that you're somewhere in this 45 to 50 degree field of view, which would be entirely reasonable for a projection setup, uh, that's going to mean you want somewhere between a 92 and a um, 98 or so um, diagonal screen size, which is very, very doable. Uh, 92 is a common screen size and 98 or 100 is also a common screen size. So that shouldn't be a problem and that's going to be the screen size that I'm going to recommend to you. Now I'm going to say go to see more AV because you are sitting about eight feet from eyes to screen. You need their center stage ultra fine acoustically transparent uh, screen material. You got to go for the ultra fine when you're sitting that close. Uh, really no other acoustically transparent fabric is going to do. So that's a fairly easy answer. Now you get it in the fixed frame. They have a couple of different frame options. They have their Premier fixed frame, which is their little bit more expensive one. And they have their Precision fixed frame, which is a little bit less expensive. And that's great because you can get a... Now, they their standard screen size that they start selling on their online store is 97.5 inches diagonally, which if you want a little bit more than a 45 degree field of view already perfect. And in the precision frame, the little bit less expensive one, it's $750. So $3,800 for the projector, $750 for the screen, or um, it's a little bit more expensive on the screen if you go for the premiere frame. But I'm thinking the slightly narrower frame bezel would be kind of nice in this case anyway, because you don't want to uh, you know, be taking up all that space just with frame. So yeah, $750 or so is what you're looking at for the screen. And I'd probably go right for that 97.5 inch diagonal. It's $1,100 for the premier frame. I just looked it up. So even if you went with the more expensive frame, it would still sort of fit within this budget. And hopefully that's enough money to also construct your front, uh, your false wall up front. That's going to be about one foot in front of your physical wall. So I think that covers all of that. Uh, he did ask, should he be thinking about constant image height? Uh, for your budget, that's, that's really, there, you can't afford masking. Because uh, if you're going to do constant image height, either with starting with a cinemascope screen, which you would then mask the left and right sides to create a smaller 16 by 9 image, or starting with a 16 by 9 screen and then masking the top and bottom to create a cinemascope image, uh, either way you need the masking and you can't really fit that into your budget. 
Also, when you get this JVC projector, the black bars that it produces, they're not quite OLED black, but they're as black as any projector is going to get you. And I don't find them distracting at all, even without masking. So I think you're in good stead there. His last one was that he's worried whether the X790 is going to be able to throw the uh, screen size that he wants within this room. Well, the projector itself is about 19 inches from front to back. Uh, and you're going to want to leave a little bit of room behind that for your cables and stuff. So call it two feet, call it two feet from the wall behind the projector to the lens of the projector. And I would absolutely recommend that you just construct a shelf on your back wall way up high because this projector has lots of zoom range and lots of lens shift. And that's the cheapest and easiest way to put this projector into your room, a shelf on your back wall up high. Uh, so that's going to give it a distance of 10 and a half feet, we're going to say, because we've subtracted one foot from the front wall for your false wall and two feet from the back wall to where the lens is going to be. So now that's at 10 and a half feet from the lens of the projector to the screen. And that X790 can throw an image anywhere between 51 and 103 inches when the lens is 10 and a half feet away from the screen. So 98 inches, no problem. That all works out. All right, so last question for this week is going to be David, who wrote in on Twitter. Uh, David is asking on behalf of a friend of his, and it's actually the friend's dad who's getting this TV, so we're kind of like, what, fourth way down the line of giving advice. Uh, but he wants a recommendation for a television that is 80 inches or larger, but for under $4,000. It's also going to be going into a room that has lots of light because there's a 10 foot tall wall of just windows, floor to ceiling windows. So he's got lots of light coming in. And uh, he was kind of wondering, should he be concerned about edge lighting versus full array local dimming at this price point for this size and this type of uh, setup with lots of ambient light? That's less the question to me. Really what you're looking for is you do want high light output, although again, I'm really not worried about that regardless of what you get. But a 77-inch a OLED is first of all smaller than 80 inches and definitely more than $4,000. So OLED isn't even a consideration. We're definitely looking at LCDs here. I would try to get the one that has the very best anti-reflective screen coating that I can. And that would be from Samsung if you could get their Q8 FN. Uh, this year they have a tremendously good anti-reflective coating on the Q7, Q8, and Q9 series. Those three series at the top of their QLED range all got this really, really excellent anti-reflective coating on them. Uh, and the Q8 is the only one out of those three series, the Q7, Q8, and Q9, that has a screen size larger than 80 inches. It's 82 inches in the case of the QN82 Q8 FN. That's the full bottle number. Now, right this moment, the lowest I could find the price for a brand new Q8 FN in the 82 inch screen size was $4,300. You can definitely find it at $4,500. That's sort of the regular price right now. $4,300 is available. Um, so could you spend $300 more than the full $4,000 budget to get that really excellent anti-reflective coating? It's, it's a high brightness television as well. It can hit like 1500 nits peak. And it's got the quantum dots, so you got the wide color and all of it. If you absolutely cannot stretch a budget, or I don't know if it's going to go on sale at all on Black Friday, usually the 82-inch models don't because it's not common enough to go on a Black Friday sale. But if that's just too much money, uh, then I would go to the Q6. Uh, so the Q6 is available in 82 inch size. You still get the quantum dot. You still get the high brightness. You still get the full wide range of color. It doesn't have the same super duper good anti-reflective coating. Still got a good one, uh, just not the tremendously good one that's available in the Q8. But now you can get it for $3,000 for sure. And the lowest price I found for brand new was $2,900. So you're definitely under $4,000 there. Um, you will see a lot of people recommending the NU8000. Um, to me, so it's available for even less. The NU8000 you can find down around $2,500. So that, of course, is attractive from a price perspective, but you lose the quantum dot, so it doesn't have the full wide color. It's not quite as bright. And most importantly, all of the QLED televisions from Samsung use their most advanced LCD panels with the highest native contrast on them. So the Q8 actually is full array local dimming. So that whole question of should he worry about edge lighting versus full array, probably not going to be a huge concern because the, the deepest black levels in a room with this much light is not really what you're worried about. But 
Uh, you're getting the full array local dimming, so you get the, the better uniformity of the screen if you can afford the Q8 plus that more important thing of the super duper good anti-reflective coating, but also the LCD panel itself in all of the QLEDs from Samsung has higher contrast than in all of their non QLED models. And that's visible even with a lot of ambient light. So the NU8000, nice TV, definitely affordable, but the Q6 is certainly available for under $4,000. Uh, so if the Q8 is too expensive, I'd go for the Q6. All right. So that's going to be everyone for this week. On the list still, we have Samuel C, Alex, Christian S, and I believe it's Jorge uh, S. I'm pretty sure that's how I pronounce that name. So uh, yes, uh, you gentlemen are on the list already for next week. Did get some questions that came in on Monday and Tuesday. So I received those by email and you'll be on the topic list for next week as well. So we'll go back and uh, thank our listeners of the week once again. Uh, if you would like your question answered on this podcast, please email us. That's question at avrant.com. By far the best way to get in touch with us. Please send your questions in there, question at avrant.com. And we want to thank Sam who donated to us uh, via our PayPal account. That's uh, if you come to avrant.com over on the right hand side, there's a support the podcast button, take you to PayPal. So Sam, thanks very much for doing that. Also want to thank our 75 patrons. That's over at patreon.com slash avrantpodcast. If you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation, and we'd like to thank Jeff G who uh, took our advice, called up AV Science, and bought himself a JVC RS540 projector. So congrats on that, and thanks for letting AV Science know that we recommended them to you. Uh, yeah, so I believe that's going to be it for this week, and uh, Tom already bid adieu, so on his behalf, this has been AV Rant. I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.